Hey Ravens, I'm going to go ahead and keep us on track with our read aloud of The Canyon's Edge by Dusty Bowling. We're starting with the chapter and the poem called Waiting. The water arrived like a tsunami, but it leaves like bathwater trickling down a hair clogged drain. I hug the wall every muscle tense and aching, my body one big ball of pain. I wait and wait and wait as the water slowly, painfully lowers, getting drunk by the eternally thirsty ground. I will it to drink faster before I fall. I wait for seconds, minutes, hours, days, months, years. My muscles shake with fatigue, my vision blurs with tears, my heart pounds with the full force of having to watch both my parents torn apart. Shame, self-condemnation from unprocessed guilt and shame is never helpful. Dad's height. By the time the canyon is gray, the water is finally low enough for me to drop onto the outcropping. I look down through a curtain of sweaty, damp hair, already wishing I hadn't taken out my ponytail, and see the rock, the waters just beneath it now flowing at a stroll rather than a sprint. It's about six feet down, Dad's height, because that's how high he could lift me. The pain and pressure in my chest grow as if someone is punching my heart. I have to climb down, but I know before I even begin it's impossible. Climbing down is nothing like climbing up. Plus, I have boots on, and the wall below me is wet. I don't have any choice. I can't hang on to this wall in another minute, and I don't have the strength to climb up out of this canyon. My heart pounds hard enough so that send tremors through my body, make my fingers, hands, and arms shudder, lowering one unsteady boot for a foothold below me. I cry because I know I'm about to fall. Slipping. My boot slips, my fingers, hands, and arms too weak to hang on, sliding down the wall, slowing my fall with friction, sanding skin off my palms, forearms, and knees. My body so filled with adrenaline, I don't yet feel the pain. I hit the outcropping, boots first, and my feet slip out from under me. My right hip, ribs, arm slam against the rocky ledge, my teeth knocking together, biting my tongue. I slide into the water, frantically grasp at the crack in the rock and stop myself. Half my body in the water, which is trying to pull me from the ledge, I drag myself out, my mouth filling with blood, lie on my side and pull my legs up to my chest. And now the pain comes. It radiates over my torn skin like a fire, barrels into the battered bones like a fighter, blood drips from my hands and knees and mouth onto the rock. It spreads like watercolors on the wet stone. The second time, I've lost my backpack, hoodie, hair tie, helmet, harness, gloves, food, water, last person in my life. I have nothing left except my life. That's the second time in a single year one of my parents put my life before theirs. Sinking. The canyon is dimming. I need to get moving before it gets too dark. I need to find Dad. It's risky to walk in the desert with no light at all. There could be snakes, scorpions, spiny cactuses. I push myself up, my arms shaking with the effort, still worn out from clinging to the wall. I lean over and look down at the ground a few feet below, puddles everywhere, but no longer enough water to flow. I drag my legs around and shove myself off the rock. My boots sink deep into the dark sledge like quicksand, too deep. I'm stuck, stuck in this muck, my muscles too fatigued to pull out my boot. I grasp my leg with both hands and pull with all my strength. Boot, my boot finally breaks free with a loud sucking sound, completely soaked in sludge. I won't be walking anywhere tonight, so I climb back up on the rock. Maybe dad didn't go too far. I cry out for him, hoping he'll hear me, hoping he'll call back. I listen, nothing. I'll have to wait here on this rock for now, just for now until dad returns. Why? 
I lie back on the rock and watch as the silver sliver of sky above me turns to black, taking all light in the canyon with it. There's nothing to do except let my hand, mind wander to places I don't want to visit. It's always the same places, even here and now. Why? 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 There has to be a reason why a person would walk into a restaurant and just start shooting. I need to know the reason so desperately that Dad sent me to Mary. But Mary still hasn't told me why. And if there's no why, then I'm just small and powerless. A single drop of water in a raging river. A single grain of sand in a suffocating dust storm. A single speck of Palo Verde pollen floating on the dry desert breeze. Unanchored, untethered, unpredictable. Unable to see what the future holds. Unable to see where I'll land. One, raging river. I badly need to know right now, but no one is here to tell me why. So I imagine it for myself. I remember those dark mountains to the west. I picture the rain running down the sides of the mountains in hundreds of small streams, which become tens of brooks, which become a few creeks, which become one raging river in a previously dry riverbed that gradually deepens into a narrow slot canyon. One raging river that washes my father away. What if? <clears throat> As though my mind is made of metal, it's pulled by a magnet to another place, an unhelpful, unhealthy place. It's the place of what ifs. What if I'd picked another restaurant? What if we'd sat at a different table? What if we'd gone for lunch instead of dinner? What if it wasn't my birthday? Then mom would still be here and dad would still be here and I wouldn't be here alone at the bottom of a dark canyon, breathing. And so I am, sitting on this cold, wet rock in the dark, alone with my thoughts, with the whys and the what ifs. And I feel myself falling deeper and deeper into my anger, which spirals like the brightening stars above me. It's a tornado turning, a choppy sea churning, a bone dry desert burning ever more out of control. My heart pounds, I want to scream. Remember your breathing, Eleanor. I cry out for dad again, funneling my anger, my breath into my voice. My cries echo over and over against the tall canyon walls, following the path of the flood, the path to dad. But dad's a great swimmer, but his leg, dad's strong, but those floodwaters may be stronger. Dad has his backpack. But all that debris, the water so filled with sticks and stones and sludge could tear it from his body. Dad knows how to survive in the desert, but he's never faced anything like this. I know he's out there somewhere in the dark of this canyon, but is he still alive? Yes, he's alive and he knows where I am. He'll find me, but I know he can't find me tonight in the dark and the mud. I lie back on the cold rock, a trail floating back to me from somewhere down the canyon. Dad! Trill. I sit up. Listen, it sounds like a whistle. Dad is whistling for me. Wait, did Dad bring a whistle? The trill rings through the canyon again and again, and then something is trilling very close to me. And then several somethings are trilling around me like a screeching chorus. Holding up my legs, I press my forehead into my knees, push my hands back through the air and squeeze it tightly at my scalp. It's not dad. It's the red spotted toads digging themselves out from under the soaked ground. I lie down on my side and clamp my hands over my ears to try to block them. Wind. I know it must be at least midnight because the toads finally quiet back down. I lift my hands from my ears and rub them over my chilled arms. I remember camping with mom and dad at the bottom of Canyon de Celli, how the winds blew at night. I can still hear them groaning against our tent walls, the sound almost deafening, frightening me. I thought it was monsters. It's just the wind, Nora, dad assured me, hugging me to him. 
When the canyon walls cool at night, it causes the air to blow hard. Don't worry, sweetheart, nothing can hurt us down here. The next morning, our Dine guide told us the winds are part of the way the canyon expresses sealism, sealism, harmony. But I feel right now, all I feel right now is disharmony. Our Dine guide told us the canyon gives much to those who would receive it. That may be true of Canada Chelly, but I don't think this canyon has anything to give me. This canyon only takes away. Burning. The canyon winds pick up the slice over, my, over me like an icicle. My body starts to shake uncontrollably. My clothes are still damp and the wind is like winter. For the 366th night in a row, I wish my mom were here to take me in her arms and comfort me and sing the song she used to sing, but she's not. So my mind goes back to the last time I saw her alive, how she wished me happy birthday, sweetheart, and the guitarist played a song while I ate fried ice cream with a bright blue candle burning. Flame. Another mom was there. Sophia Moreno, just a regular mom sitting in the booth next to ours. I remember how she and her two little boys had clapped when the server brought out the fajitas, how she'd pulled her kids to her to keep them from touching the flame. And so my thoughts keep circling back to fire. Drifting with nothing but whys and what ifs and burning memories and freezing winds to keep me company, my eyes start to feel as heavy as the boulders the flood washed away like pebbles. How can I possibly sleep when I'm so cold? How can I possibly sleep? How can I... How... Nightmare. First come the tremendous booms. My mother, singing to me seconds ago, is shoving me under the table so frantically, so desperately, that I bash my head on the edge and her fingers leave bruises on my body. What is happening? Then more booms, and Mom is covered in blood. Dad is screaming, 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 and there are more booms and more blood. I squeeze my eyes shut as I press my cheek to Mom's knee, and then I force my eyes open and turn my head, smearing her blood across my face. I see his lower half from under the table, enormous, camouflaged legs and boots. I see the tip of his weapon and then him slowly, gradually, deliberately bending over to find me under the table. I'm frozen, can't move, can't scream, can't breathe, can't think anything, but I am going to die. This time he'll get to me before the blur of brown legs, Sophia Moreno's legs, when she did what she did. The yipping of coyotes above startles me awake on this hard rock, my body filled with tremors, every nerve shooting pain. I know I shouldn't. I know it's not supposed to, but I won't let him near me. So I build my wall and I lay my shame and brick and anger, and stone, and guilt, and clay, and fear, and rock, and hate. Layer after layer, but I know deep inside, it's really all just frosted flakes. Weakness. I wait for numbness. I'm colder than I've ever been, both inside and out. The wall won't hold, Eleanor. Yes, it will. Don't make me think about him. Rewrite it into something where you are stronger, braver, more powerful. But I'm not. But you are. Almost. I am freezing. No. I am almost freezing. If I were frozen, I would be numb, peaceful, asleep, but not dreaming. In some horrible way, I wish I were completely frozen because that wouldn't hurt as much as almost because I wouldn't have to feel him clawing at every tiny gap in my wall that is almost strong enough to keep him out. Lie. Who is the beast, Eleanor? The beast only exits in, exists in my dreams. Really, he's just make-believe. Everything about him non-existent. The beast isn't rational or real. 
not real. I feel lost, floating the ink of the canyon. I slip in and out of consciousness, too exhausted to stay awake, too cold to fully sleep. I curl my body into a tight ball, hug my legs to my chest, rub my bare arms, breathe warmth into my sore, sanded hands. I wonder how much my body temperature is dropping and I curse myself for taking off my hoodie. This night will never end. Every time I drift, I hear him coming closer, closer, and every time I feel my mind slip away before startling awake again, drifting, walking, waking, drifting, waking all night long. Shivering, shuddering, shaking, quaking all night long, telling myself he's not real. He's not real, he's not real all night long, but never ever rewriting anything all night long. And then something wondrous. The sky is lighting again. Relief at seeing the light fills me up, spills over down my cheeks and onto the cold rock. I watch the sun turn the ribbon of sky above me from speckled black velvet to deep purple satin to beautiful pink silk. I've made it through the torturous night my wall held. I kept him away. I need to move to heat my body cold. Pushing myself up, I peer at the ground, which still looks damp. I carefully slide down the rock, allowing one boot to touch the ground. It doesn't sink in nearly as much as last night, so I put both feet down. My legs give out and I stumble, my knees digging into the soaked silt, mud smothering and sanding and stinging my sores. I stand up, dizzy, spinning, leaning against the outcropping. I focus on putting one foot in front of the other, concentrate on taking step after step. My rubbery legs feel more steady with each movement. My breathing evens out. My heart slows its slamming. I stop. Should I instead walk to the Jeep? Break a window? Wait for help? Who would come? Too hot. No water. All supplies swept away. Walk to the main road? How far is it? Could I find the way? Too hot. No water. All supplies swept away. I look down the canyon in the direction of dad making his way back to me right now. I know he would never leave without me and I won't leave without him. Colors. I find a small puddle in a hollow spot on a rock and lap up as much water as I can. And then I look up at the slice of sky and long to be in the sun again. The canyon looks different today lichen burst like fireworks around me in different shades of green, lime, and split pea and mint. The layers wobble and waver. It's as though a small child ran through the canyon while I lay on that rock all night and colored the walls outside the lines with wild scribbles in deep, angry red canyon. Steps. I focus on taking one step at a time toward dad. He'll find me. He's walking back to me right now, just as I'm walking to him, and then we'll figure it out together. Step, step, step. The air is warming. My steps are faster. My body is heating. So thirsty. I stop at every puddle I find in the sunken, sunken spots on rocks. Each one seems smaller than the last. I climb over a large boulder blocking the narrow path and then reach a broader opening, grateful for the space, wide enough to let it in more light, wide enough for a flood tattered ironwood tree, debris littering its broken branches, to too grown from a seed blown down a long time ago. Step by step, I move around the tree and the canyon narrows again, shuts out the light, step, step, step. Dad will find me soon loss. I see something in the distance sticking out of the ground. As I near it, I find a piece of garbage washed into the canyon from who knows where. An old plastic cup, a sign of human life. Garbage. But a cup can be useful. A cup can hold water. Lifting it out of the mud, I find it's only part of a cup. I try to put it in my pocket, but it crumbles, brittle from the brutal heat. I wipe the pieces from my sore palms, 
and they flutter to the ground around a pile of broken shale. One shard of gray shale catches my eye and I pick it up. It's flat and sharp on one end. I run a finger along the razor-like edge. It scratches me, draws a tiny amount of blood. I slip the rock into my back pocket. This stone knife could be useful down here in the canyon. I imagine myself using it to skin the hide of a kangaroo rat and snort at the thought. I move my hand to my front pocket, but the heart-shaped stone isn't there. My eyes blur and my lip quivers, and I want to crumble to the ground like the fluttering, brittle bits of broken cup. I wipe my eyes and bite my lip and stay standing. I don't have time to get all bent out of shape over a lost rock. Endless walls. The light lowers down the wall, warming the canyon. How long have I been walking? It's hard to tell when I can't see the sun. It really already feels like I've walked inches feet, yards, miles, and miles. Every My steps quicken and my heart speeds with anticipation as I round every new corner expecting dad to appear, but all I find are more walls made of waves like the water that carved them. That sound, effervescent, sizzling, like dad frying sausage in the morning, coiled head, held high and back, ready to spring, fill me with venom if I get too near. Tongue flicks over and over again, smelling me, figuring me out. A narrow tunnel of sunlight shines down into the canyon, cracking the silt under my feet and warming the snake. It's also drying the last of my puddles and scorching my pale, sun-starved skin. It must be about noon. I pick up a stone from the canyon floor and toss it at the snake which rattles its warning at me, but it doesn't move away. I'm so, so tired. I'm swaying on my feet. I sit down on a rock out of striking distance and study my snake. Looks like a diamond back, but greenish tinge, fading diamond patterns, white rings on tail, wider than black rings. It's a Mojave, deadly venomous. I have no choice but to wait it out. My head nods in exhaustion. The warmth is like a drug dragging under me. I keep my boots on the canyon floor as I lean to the side and rest my head on the rock. The stone is warm against my cheek and arms and I'm instantly drifting, no longer concerned about the deadly snake in my way. I'm gone, floating away, into the darkness of my mind, away to the place where he can find me another life. You can be honest, Eleanor. Who is the beast? Maybe you're not listening or don't want to listen, but I have no more to say. The beast is not even real. Panic. Booms. Always come first, then the blood. I hear him. He's catching up with me. Crunch, crunch, crunch. I startle awake, jump off the rock, and then stumble back away from the rattling snake. Snake, I'd so quickly forgotten. Do it now, Eleanor. Rewrite your nightmare. I can't. I'm spiraling, untethered and wild like the whirlpools I spied in the flood. I'm sure the beast is coming, and the rattling of the snake has become chains, and the red of the canyon has become blood, and the shadow of the canyon has become death. Ground yourself, Eleanor. Coping. Grounding techniques for coping with PTSD. Use your five senses. Grounding. Where am I? In the canyon. What do you see? The snake, walls around me, dirt below me. What do I hear? The rattling. At home, I turn on music, but here I speak out loud. I am here in the canyon. What do I feel? I reach out and touch the canyon wall, rough, warm stone. I bend down and grab a handful of dirt, massage it between my hands. What do I smell? The desert. Creosote, sage, and dust. What do I taste? At home, I keep a jar of chocolates in my room. I put one in my mouth and focus on the melting to keep me grounded. In the here and now, in the canyon, I taste only the bitterness of my unbrushed mouth. Who is with me? No one but the snake. No one but this snake. No one but this snake. Are you likely to die in this situation? Yes. Keep moving. Move! 
I yell at the snake, move, move, move. But it only rattles back at me. I need to keep moving so I don't fall back asleep so I can find dad. Move, move, move. But it will be me who will have to move. And so I run around the snake, but too quickly, too carelessly, too clumsily, it strikes at my ankles. I jump, stumble, crawl just out of its reach. It is poised for another strike as I back away like a crab, then scramble to my feet and run away. Needles. My run-in with the snake has left me shaky, sweaty, dried mouth. I need water, but my precious puddles are gone. I spot a barrel cactus growing low enough for me to reach, run to it, study it, but I'm not sure what species it is. Dad taught me there's only one kind that won't make me violently sick. I pull out my sharp shale attempt to pierce the cactus, but instead the needles pierce me. I try to shave the needles off, but they don't give. Raising my foot high, I kick at them. One needle pierces my boot, buries itself in my heel. Stumbling back on my butt, I cry out in pain and then dig the needle out of my shoe. Standing again, I stare down the cactus. Did I really think I could open this tough, unyielding thing with only my stone knife? My eyes well with tears, but I wipe them away. Really, it's for the best. I'm not sure what species it is, and that's a mistake I shouldn't make. Digging. I have no other choice but to fall back to the ground, my knees in the mud, which already isn't as wet as it was this morning. I push my hands into the cool ground. I dig down deep, throwing the wet dirt to the side. My long hair falls in my face, and I push my muddy hands through it over and over to keep it back. Why did I have to undo my ponytail? My fingernails are dark with mud, and I hear Mom's voice. Are you growing watermelons in there? Save one for me, please. Mom loved watermelon. I think of Danielle as I dig and dig and dig. When we tried mud masks, and got mud all over the bathroom, door handles, couch, and carpet. How we'd each written a word on each other's foreheads and then couldn't stop laughing when we looked in the mirror and saw we'd both spelled out the same thing. Poop. Dad said we shared the same strange brain, but if that were true, we'd still be friends. I dig and I dig and I swipe hair from my face with muddy hands and I wait, but the water doesn't pool. I fall back and stare at my stupid hole the mud tossed around the edges, breathing hard, sweating, hair blanketing my face, my heel still throbbing from the cactus needle. It's always harder than I expect. Before and after. I sit and think and breathe and twist one long strand of hair around my finger. I hold the strand in front of my face and stare at the clear line of my before and after hair where my life broke into two parts so easily identifiable, like a ring in a tree thinner than the rest, indicating a drought occurred that year in the highest desert, forcing the people to move on to another place. A park ranger taught us that at Montezuma Castle when the three of us used to adventure. The foot of hair from the tip is, before, is my before hair. It's streaked with gold, red, brown, and blonde as though it's reflecting the colors of the canyon, vivid and shining and alive, grown during a time of safety, love, and adventure. My before hair is hair my mother would have touched when she was asking me about my school day or telling me a new story idea. My before hair is hair Danielle would have braided into a fishtail while we watched movies in the middle of the night, hair she would have rubbed lemon into before we lay out in the pool together. My before hair is hair that would have been regularly washed, brushed, and styled. The six inches of hair from the root is my after hair. My after hair is irregularly washed, brushed, and never styled except to be put up in a ponytail. My after hair is only one shade, having been kept in the dark, unchanged by desert days, filled with chlorine and sun and adventure. My after hair has never been touched by mom or Danielle. How can I do this? How can I make it? the canyon with all of this before and after in my face the entire way. A drink. An idea finally comes. I need to separate sand and water 
filter strain. I remove my white tank top and lay it on the ground. I scoop handfuls of mud onto my shirt. I fold it up like a sack and hold it over my head, opening my mouth widely, my chapped lips tight and stinging. I squeeze. It's quiet in the canyon, except for the buzzing of a fly that has found me. It whirs around my tossed back head, making me feel even dizzier while brown water trickles into my mouth. I don't have anything better than this dirty tank top to filter it. No iodine tablets to purify it, no fire to boil it, but I'll be out here before sickness has time to set in. That is where we're gonna stop for today. We'll start with Carried Away on Tuesday at 3.15, The Canyon's Edge by Dusty Bowling.